I heard one word from Orlando that really struck me at the depth of my heart, Maria Callas, <laughs> whom I will mention again, okay, later. I cannot give a talk without mentioning Callas, Maria Callas, Tennessee Williams, and Tennessee Williams, Tennessee Williams and Vivian Lee. You know, the, these are the idols, particularly Maria. So now we're, today we're talking about Peking opera, then absolutely I'm going to talk about Italian opera. The little that I know, all I know is coloratura. Bellini, Donizetti, even Rossini is not that good for me. Puccini is, <laughs> Puccini is Hollywood background music, okay? For me, Bellini, number one, and then Donizetti, and then maybe, of course, Mozart. But then it's a Mozart, he started it all. But if we talk about that, it's Handel who started it all. But what am I doing here? I'm digressing already. <laughs> as I was, as the Beijing Opera was much on my mind a few days ago, <clears throat> these lines by Thomas Nash, the 16th century English poet. These lines caught me unawares when he wrote, Spring, oh sweet spring, is the year's pleasant king. Then blooms each thing, then maid stands in the ring. So today I'm here to talk about uh, Beijing Opera. But before I do that, I have some business to do. I have a few persons to thank, without whom, any of them, there couldn't be this, and there wouldn't be me standing here. Of course, that, that, that is not necessarily a good thing, you know, my being here. <laughs> but I, the thankfulness that I feel, I need to express it. And <clears throat> just to get the title and the, and the names ready, so I type them out. I didn't want to make any mistakes. Um, I'm going to thank the following people, not in the order of what they mean to me. They mean equally important to me. So, uh, Chief Zhong Liang Chen, Chen Zhong Liang, Mr. Chen, and, and uh, uh, Director Cecilia Elizade. Uh, my baby. <laughs> she did well, right? Yeah, the few Chinese sounds that she uttered. <laughs> comes from perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, reviser and Mr. Senor Prats Paez. I pronounced it right, right? Good, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Chairwoman Xiao Wei Ji. Ji Xiao Wei. And uh, she's, uh, uh, as I said, without any of these people, uh, I couldn't possibly have been here. And this talk, I don't think, I mean, my talk couldn't be here. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Last but not least, I need to thank one lady and her great man. Who is this woman? She's sitting right here. Do <laughs> yeah, translator. For me, she is the top. And then through her, I met her husband. She dragged him along. Now we are the best of friends. You know, we're, we're the best of friends. Do you think it's possible for a December and May friendship last? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Anyway, this time, without Miss Zhu Ye, I really couldn't have done a thing because I am a total idiot when it comes to putting PPT together and uh, mm -hmm. handouts together and all that. Which is not to say I'm good at other things. Yeah, I'm equally bad. But I'm particularly bad at, at those uh, things involving te technology. 
And when Zhu Yan and I, and I sometimes we met some problems or difficulties, which was the past few days, it was very tough for her, not for me, because you guys are so lucky. You never worked with me. If you work with me, I'm going to torment you to death. Okay, three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to call. Hello, how's that PPT going? And I don't like that one little picture there. No, she had to change. And then when we, both of us, we ran out of what, out of, we are completely out of wits with some things. So she looked, looks at me and I look at her back and we stare at each other. Then I said, Hai Biao. Hai Biao is the husband. You know, mm -hmm. Mr. Ting is sitting right there. So without the two of them, I couldn't have been any, I, I couldn't have done anything worthy. Now I'm not sure, you know, because it sounds like I'm going to do something worthy, but I'm not sure yet. So these people I must thank from the depth of my heart. I really am very thankful. And my gratitude towards them knows no bounds. Now, since antiquity, the Chinese have been in the firm belief that a perfect performing art must be one, blending all three major components of the theater, which are singing, dancing, and acting, three in one. And that is none other than the very quintessence of Beijing opera, which reigns supreme as the national theater of China for the past three centuries. This Beijing opera is a proud descendant offspring of the Yuan poetic drama of the 13th century. So you know how old it is. Everything that I talk, I give lectures, only talk about old people. You have, you have seen the movie, Dead Poets uh, Club. Poet uh, poetry club. I am that teacher. I'm Robert Williams. <laughs> Five salient outer features mark this theater. Firstly, there are uh, four major row types in this theater. The female row type, the male row type, which includes to sub row times, elderly men and young men, and then the painted face row type, designed, created for extremely macho or heroic or particularly larger than life, iniquitous and wicked man. And then, last but not least, the clown row type. There are other sub row types under these four row types. But because of the, the limitation of time of my talk, I always digress a lot. So time is never enough for me. You know. Do you feel the same way when you go out to talk? <laughs> because it's my fault because I digress. You know, people call me, people don't call me king of digress digressing for nothing. I, I like to digress. So <clears throat> if I start to digress, you must, it's your job to put a stop to it, okay? You have to say enough, go back to a Beijing opera. <laughs> okay, these, all these road types, they sing in falsetto, except for the clown. The clown road type sings alt alternately in their street voice, everyday voice, regular voice, or falsetto. Playing the female road type, one must be a soprano, mezzo, and contrato, three, all in one, all three in one, which is not unlike Maria Callas, 
in Bellini's Norma. When, when she sings a wide range of, uh, of her vocals, up to three octaves. You understand what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. She can sing from... She just goes up and there. Although her singing life was kind of brief, but then, like beautiful flowers, you know, she wilted. She was, she was, she was opera, as New York, New York Times said in her obituary. She was opera. Those ten years, it was the golden ten years in the history of opera. She, in my opinion, she surpassed Caruso. So, a uh, Peking opera singer, singing female role type, you have. To, you have to be a soprano, mezzo, and contrato, all three in one. So in the Bellini's Norma, uh, Maria Callas does, does that. At times, she, she uh, burst out just like a contrato. That's that low. She was gorgeous. And when she hit a high E, she would hit high E. And it was a piece of cake in her heydays. And likewise, playing the, playing the uh, uh, male road type is the same. One must be a tenor, baritone, and bass, three in one, for the elderly men type. For the young men road type, it's a counter tenor, which is not unlike Handel's Cesare, which is the uh, Italian Latin way to pronounce Caesar, Julius Caesar, Cesare. That is a wonderful opera. So if you catch it with, with, a, uh, with a metropolitan uh, uh, singers, don't miss it. it. It's really nice. As sung, Cesare, sung by Daniel, uh, uh, David Daniels, uh, the countertenor. As I mentioned before, all singing is falsetto. So now let's talk about the second outer feature, which is about the tunes of uh, all these operas in Beijing opera, uh, in this genre. Now, <laughs> I can see that you're paying great attention, which is to my liking. Uh, this is very important. And it took me, I had to rewrite it quite a few times before I got it right. Because it's, it, it would sound very intricate and uh, unusual for someone who is used to Western opera, operas or Western music. Now, in Beijing opera, more than 25 set tunes, I repeat, set tunes tunes. There are already existing set tunes. All these uh, 25 set tunes, they express different moods that make up the tunes of all arias. And into these set tunes, libretti in Chinese language expressing different moods in different scenes are composed. It is the exact opposite in the Western operas, because in the Western opera, the role played between a librettist. You and Ali. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the role played between uh, a librettist and the composer is such that the librettist comes first. First you have the words, then composer, Mozart, Bellini, Donizetti, they would write music, Verdi, every composer. But in Chinese, it's the other way around. We already, we already have the tunes, and words are set into it. So what about all these 25 tunes? What are the melodies? Some of them are like Allegro, 
or allegretto, or in Italian, allegretto giogroso, you know, or allegretto molto, you know, that, like that. It's like for high spirit. And then the, uh, these 25, they cover the sad music area, which is more like adagio or largo, you know, in, a, in, a, in the opera and in music. And then, of course, there is uh, um, andante. And andante is inseparable from romente. You know, the, like the piano concerto number 20, the second movement happens to be romente. It's not adagio, although they are kind of similar. So these 25 set tunes cover all these tunes, the, these tunes that express moods. So if someone wants to compose a new Peking opera, you have to select uh, one set tune and write characters into it, <laughs> which I just mentioned is the exact opposite of how a Western opera is conceived. Class, have I made myself clear? Mm -hmm. I, I hate to sound like, you know, like, like as if I were questioning, questioning your intelligence. On the, op, on the contrary, I'm questioning whether or not I'm explaining clearly, because this point is kind of important. So in Chinese, you would, you would hear, you say, who wrote these 25 uh, tunes? We don't know. It's, it developed during the centuries. And it wasn't until the 18th century, early 18th century, an emperor of the Manchu uh, dynasty, he called four grand operas in China, the Si Da Hui Fan. So he called them to Beijing, to the capital, to celebrate the birthday of uh, Empress Dowager. So he said, I'm so tired of this Quan Chi. Quan Chi is a very poetic and elegant and a bit too refined. So it's a little bit more like, um, more like Schubert's leader, you know, based on, based on Goethe or based on uh, 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 all this high poetry. So after hundreds of years of listening to Quan Chi, he says, I'm just tired of this. So you guys, you are the four grandest operas, local operas from China. You get together and come up with a national musical drama theater. So, of course, at the request and the, at the command of the emperor, so all of these musicians and actors, they got, quickly got together and they found the most pleasing sounds from the south, from Suzhou uh, and from Beijing and from Shanxi, or the northwestern part of China, and they try to create an ideal national musical drama. And this is the birth of Beijing Opera. This is how it started. So in other words, they selected the most beautiful music from all these local theaters. So if you ask me, who wrote these in, in the Western culture, you say, Last week, I went to see a grand performance, grand performance. There are still two performances, performances left. One, one left, Saturday. If you have the time, catch it. La Clementa di Tito by Mozart. It's rarely produced at the Met. Okay, by all means, the great Joyce Donato. You know, I don't know, something is with these Italian and uh, Greeks, you know, they can sing, they can perform. Yeah, when, when the, the Italian singers, when they're singing, you know, they're just unsurpassed. So I saw that one. <clears throat> and everybody would say, Mozart yeah, composed this. But if you ask me who composed these 25 tunes, I cannot tell you. So now you know the reason. It's not because, because it's from different places and nobody in Chinese culture, all we uh, respect is the words. And we do not care who designed the music. 
it could well be uh, created by local peasants, like a love song from way back, from during the uh, Zhou period, during the spring and autumn era. <coughs> And now, it's almost inconceivable for you, for anyone in the Western world, to hear the tune of uh, La Donna e Mobile from Rigoletto. You know the, that famous bam, 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 bam. Yes? We all know this, right? So it's la donna e mobile, you know, it, it, which means a uh, woman is fickle, you know. But it's really not necessarily so. Yeah. But so I think Verdi was a sexist, you know. But so <laughs> it's hardly imaginable, let alone possible <clears throat> or probable, for anyone to hear the same tune as bam, 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 bam appearing in another opera set to another story. Every aria is different. That's why the, the composer is the, the one. The belletist is very important, but it must take the second place to the composer. But in Chinese, it's the other way around. So why do the Chinese people would be so crazy about all these tunes that could be the same in different operas. Because the different sounds and tones of the Chinese language, as you must know, the Chinese language is a tonal language. Every sound, say T-I-A-N, we have tian, 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 tian. And for each uh, sound of different toes could have numerous different characters meaning different things. And then this tonal scheme is usually the nemesis to all students studying Chinese. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm asking about that baby. <laughs> By the way, uh, Cecilia, your, la your last name is Italian or Spanish? One Italian and one Spanish. They so, all so, French could be. I couldn't be sure. Mm -hmm. So, is it right to say Elizade or Elizade or, or, or Elizade? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I'm not, I, I used to be a uh, language teacher. I'm no longer teaching language. You know, after 55 years of teaching language, it's just more like a machine. You know, ta 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 ta. I got tired of it. So now I just teach uh, literature and poetry. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Ben, I have a question. Yes. Nobody in China complains about the set tunes being a limited number, 25? Here is an explanation. <laughs> you see, how good I have to be careful. Our people who you want know. to create more I, tunes. Exactly. I have not come here. I, I, I'm not here without trepidation, okay? Because I know, first of all, I see a lot of, you know, my own people and people, learned people, uh, especially um, opera loves, lovers and music lovers. I mean, every human being, I think, should be an opera lover. Uh, this is the way I think. Just like, you know, there was a great professor at Beijing University, the most prominent university in China. He loved Beijing, Beijing opera, as I do. <clears throat> so he would, in his class, sometimes he, would, he was as crazy as I am. So sometimes when he was in the mood, he would all of a sudden, he was talking about poetry and stuff, all of a sudden he would break out in a Peking opera aria. You know? <laughs> then he said, do you like it? And he would ask them, Students, students are working for grades. Of course, they say, "Oh, yeah, we love it, we love it." He said, "Oh, good." He, so he said, "Oh, good, oh, good." He said, "I can't stand. I think those who do not like uh, picking opera, they're not 
Chinese people. <laughs> and then, okay. And then, two seconds, he, he thought again. He said, oh, no, 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 I should change. Those who do not like Peking Opera, Beijing Opera, they are not people. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> I'm ashamed to confess. I totally agree. I'm as crazy, I'm crazy as a as a as a as a madman like like that great he was the dean of the uh, uh, Chinese literature department. <clears throat> because uh, <clears throat> Because the different sounds and tones of the Chinese language, they render variations to the set tunes. I know some of you may never have heard, but I just give you an example. Just three notes, three characters. And they fit into the same tune, okay, from two from three different operas. They, are, they all fit into the tune which is called Nan Bangzi, which means a tune from the south. And the tune is usually, the, the, ex, the tune expresses a mood of advising or comforting or to uh, give uh, solace, consolate, to consolate someone. <coughs> usually when you need so an idea like that, you choose this. And so in one opera, it is Chuan Dai Wang. Okay, the sound. To those of you, you just have to listen and try to remember. If you, if you can remember, I love you. If you can't, I do it again. Chuan Dai Wang. So we have falling, falling, and rising. Chuan Dai Wang. One is. The other one is. Chen Xiang Gong Ah, it's identical to the first one. Am I right? But that's from another one. Is I advise you, my lord. The other one is I advise you, my man, my love. So they're from two totally different operas. But the tune of the aria, the two arias, the tune is exactly the same. <coughs> And the third opera, in the third opera, there is, again, one aria set to the tune of this southern tune, Nan Bangzi. The first three characters is Ta, Ming, Zhi, or High Tone. So do you think they are sung exactly the same way? No, because the, a Chinese singer must take care of the ton, tonal scheme. So the Two, the music is the same. The sound is a little bit like this. So this is the, the music. So the first one, because it's fourth tone. So the characters, the sound comes out falling. I, like that. And the second one is Exactly the same, right? Mm -hmm. Did you hear yeah. the same? Yeah. Uh, I do it again. That's uh, my lord. I'm, I give you some advice. And the second opera is she's talking to her loved one, a lover. So she says, I advise you, my man. So it is it's the same as the first one. Am I right, class? Did you hear the, yeah. the music being the same? Mm -hmm. But the third one, because that character tonal scheme is different. It's high tone. It's like chua. It's ta, ming, zhi. They're all high. So the same tune, but there's a little difference. 
the singing, the, so the music becomes Ta Mi Ji. Did you hear the difference? So there's this subtle difference that makes it, that pleases the ear of the aficionados and those who understand, who enjoy Beijing Opera. So these, the subtle points, they are so subtle. Unless you know the character, you know the libretto, you wouldn't know what's going on. For you, for an unfamiliar ear, they all sound the same, but they're not. They're not. Like uh, Cecilia is a human being. Benoit is a human, human being. She has two eyes. I have two eyes. But the difference between these two sets of eyes, those are beautiful eyes. These are old and ugly eyes. There is a difference. So if you look at her, you say, oh, beautiful. You look at me, ooh, I don't need dinner. You know, that's the difference. Class, have I made myself quite clear? So this is the, what, what makes a Chinese belief why not use it? So this would create an emotion of they are a little dissimilar, yet they are similar. So they are familiar to the ear of the aficionados of this theater. So it endears this theatrical genre to the audience. Instead of thinking, oh, so boring, the same too. Same tune, but not exactly the same, because the tonal schemes of these characters are different. They are sung in a very slight, slightly different way. So even though in English, in the Western culture, <clears throat> you will never hear bum, 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 appearing in another opera. But you would hear similar music. But then you know the story, you know the libretto, you know the meaning, you say, wow, this person is doing the right thing. You know, to pronounce that the third one the same way would be wrong. Because that first character is ta, is high. So you cannot do cha, no, you have to ta. Then you, you start high. But the rhythm and the tune is the same. Class, have I made myself quite clear? I had a little hard time writing this one paragraph because it's too alien to non-Chinese. I mean, even Chinese people, you say, the Western opera, they have Mozart, and who wrote these things, you know? But we do know who wrote the characters, the, the libretto, the libretti. Yes, we know who composed them, but we don't know who created the music. In, in Western culture, it's the other way around. We all know the composers. We don't know the librettists. Li but if you go to an opera performance, you get a flyer, you get a uh, playbill. The, you see Mozart and the librettist, the name. They have, they have double billing. Yeah. But the composer's name is first. But in Chinese, it is the, you know, who wrote the play, some of the plays, and, but you don't know who conceived the music. <clears throat> Another related special musical characteristic of Beijing opera is that all the singing is doubled up. Now, there is an alien word for people who are not uh, terribly um, fond of uh, opera. What does it mean, double up? Meaning, in, okay, where were we? I was talking about Norma by Bellini, the first uh, most important aria, to me, the most important aria, Casta Diva, the wonderful, the wonderful, the chaste uh, goddess she sings. And the music comes out. Bum, 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 Then Kala starts to sing, and you hear her voice. It's not accompanied as she's singing the high notes, and only, I think, in the aria, maybe 
one twentieth is accompanied by instruments. All other parts, you hear her, her own voice singing. But in Beijing Opera Theater, every syllable uttered, every sound uttered is accompanied by instruments. And that's what it means by double up. The music instruments double up the singing. So before I send that three character, three character phrase, you will hear it's accompanied by the strings and everything. It goes, and it's up to a great performer who has an extraordinary voice to top the instruments for audience to hear that. To, if you cannot top the instruments, the sounds from the instruments, the sounds of the instruments cover your, would cover the performers, the singer's voice, then the singer is considered a much lesser singer. Are you with me? The legend, that, that person, that performer, his voice, source, rises above all instruments. Put, putting 10 instruments, 20 instruments, her, his, he, it was a he who played female rope pipe. So I always got the pronouns wrong, confused. <laughs> you know, I didn't know to say he or she, sometimes I would get confused. So, his voice would always rise above a great orchestra. Doesn't matter however, however many the instruments there are, she can take it. So the chi chi there's a reason for this. So, but this musical arrangement, I would say, is a special phenomenon that exists, that exists only in classical Chinese theater. Singing is completely doubled up. I think in my arrogance, I, I think that some of you learned a new word, right? You, you all have learned the word double and up, <coughs> but doubled up, you know, <laughs> that's what it means. Meaning music com accompanies the singing completely, every word. <coughs> and. Uh, Every sound is accompanied by instruments, which are two Chinese vertical strings. Jinghu, Arhu, the two vertical string instruments, which are the Chinese answer to a violin and viola combined. And then a lute in the shape of the moon. It's called moon instrument. Yue qing. Yeah. Not pipa. Yue qing. And it, it creates a very lovely sound, not entirely unlike a sound from a fine guitar. So that accompany, accompanies. And quite often, a flute. So we have, the, we have the two strings, and the lute, and the flute. They invariably cause to mind these lines by Oscar Wilde, where he wrote, it's sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. Dance to lutes, dance to flutes is delicate and rare. I think Oscar Wilde, Wilde might have written those lines for Beijing Opera Theater. <laughs> of course, that's nonsense. <laughs> so, how do you know about it? He didn't have that one to talk to him. <laughs> <clears throat> the percussion section is led by a drummer who beats a small drum with a stick in one hand on a small drum. He, he beats. And with the, in the other hands of his, and in the other hand of his, he would clap uh, 
he would clap a pair of clappers rhythmically with the drum sound to set the pace of the play. If everything is going smoothly well, then we hear da, three, four, da, so four beats, da. So at, when you see someone walking on stage like this, that nothing is bothering me. My life is okay. Everything is smooth. Then you will hear that. But if something happens, in either great elation or great disaster, you would hear then the gong comes in gong to show, oh my God. <laughs> so that's the effect. Are you with me? Yeah, sure. So don't ever think that, oh, picking up by the Chinese classical theater is so loud with a big gong and all that. <laughs> they are there to show some dramatic effects, for God's sake. Yeah. If you like things like Harry Potter and those things and whatever, you know, because I don't watch those movies, I, you know how important music, musical uh, the uh, arrangement is. And even a great film like Gone with, Wind, Gone with the Wind, without that music, you know, it rises. Bum, 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 bum. And then you say, oh, Vivian. <laughs> right? Music's so important. So that's part of music. So it's led by a drummer, and he is setting the pace of the play. Other members include a small and large gongs, as I said before. Small and large gongs, <laughs> and a pair of, uh, and a pair of cymbals. So they're like discs. So they a pair. So you, you hear tang 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 sound. So created from and that little drum is da 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 da, and the drummer and the clapper he is the conductor of the small orchestra because he sets the pace of the play. So all these together, the gongs and the cymbals and the drum and the clappers together and along with some other instruments. Together they set pace and beats and they punctuate motions and emotions on stage. Did you hear me? Not only the way they walk. If I walk leisurely, like this, as a man, I walk like this. Nothing is bothering me. So you would hear da, da, da. And then as I'm walking, all of a sudden I see a beautiful girl. I said, I startled. And you will hear little gong. Tay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Are you with me? I'm just walking all of a sudden out of nowhere. And with uh, it's pain. So if the one who plays the, the small uh, <clears throat> gong, if I have done this, oh my god, two minutes later, pain, too late. <laughs> Backstage, I'm going to ball him out. The timing was all wrong. Where the hell were you? you know, like that. Are you with me? Yeah. That's what I meant by to punctuate motion, motions and emotions on stage. It's clear, class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please forgive me. Maybe it's the room or the excitement in me seeing you all. So you must. Please forgive me for being so vulgar as to take off my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ooh, I forgot. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel a little better. 
あ,あ Thirdly, the third、uh, salient feature, again, it's quite unusual. Strict conventions, existing conventions, strict conventions, and symbolism, they rule stage design, performance movements, makeup, and costume, meaning. Everything in this theater. In this theater, an almost bare and stark stage without scenery, except for a small rectangular table and two chairs. And all the stage props reduced to a minimum. Would result in time and distance become unlimited to give rise to a dramatic fluidity. For when an actor walks around on the stage, make a circle, the man could have walked a few steps or a few miles, or he has traveled. Hundreds of miles because there's the stark and bare stage with no scenery or props, limited props. And when he exits, and he exits, and when he re enters, a few moments, a few moments, or years may have elapsed, which Means time and distance are <coughs> annihilated. So Beijing Opera annihilates time and distance. So on a stage in a theater like this, the performer can do everything, and everything is left to the audience's imagination. So, but if you're lack of it, stay home. <laughs> <laughs> The performers in this theater, you see, are singers, dancers, and actors, all three in one. But most remarkably, they are the scenery, which, ex which well explains their otherworldly voices, elaborate makeup,、uh, resplendent robes. And dazzling headpieces. A virtually bare and stark stage without scenery enables these performers sing, dance, and act out all objects around them and all the feelings within them. With all their movements following the set conventions. So if he walks, A man must walk like this. Day, day, like that. And girl, I mean, to tell you, there are a lot of ladies here, <laughs> so they have to walk more demurely like this. <laughs> 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 These legs are getting old. Twenty <laughs> years ago, you met me. You might fall in love with me. <laughs> I'm awake or something.、Yeah. But the whole body. Do you see that? A man would be like this. They. They. But a woman would be. <laughs> Pretty good, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Without showing this, I have to make a fool of myself. I, I know I'm making a spectacle of myself. That's why I, when I decided 
what, what to wear today, you know. And I said, only black would do. You know, any color, I mean, you know, if I have to do, make a fool of myself, I better <laughs> dress more demure. <laughs> I was kind of wear a wild, uh, uh, shocking pink sweater. <laughs> and I decided against it. <laughs> uh, they are the scenery, so which explains the way they look. And the bare stage allows them to do all these things. Scenery and props would only be obstacles and distractions to their performance. The few props on stage are for dramatic effect, but not for real function. So in Chinese theater, classical Chinese theater, there's a saying, what is unreal must be treated as if it were real, vice versa. When there is something real, you have to treat it as if it were unreal. So this is an eternal theme in literature, in art, and in beauty, truth and untruth, which prompted the great Cao Xieqin, who summed up Chinese literature and Chinese culture by writing his masterpiece, The Story of the Soul, also known as Dream of the Red Chamber. And so he said, what's real is unreal. What's unreal is real. So for that, I, need, I have brought something. For instance, a fan, which you will see in the in a surprise that I brought you, you will see a, a fan. A fan, is it really for you to? <laughs> it would be unthinkable. It would be, everybody would just walk out. First they boo, boo, and bye bye. And go, they would dash, dash straight to the box office and ask for their, their money back. Okay. Fan is not for you to do this. It's a prop. It is to enhance the dramatic effect. For a man, I'm pointing. I said, wow, you are my dear daughter. <laughs> but I think you should not go there. Do you see that? It, it is like the extension of my finger. Are you with me? Yeah. To add to the drama, you my favorite girl, you shouldn't go there. <laughs> Do you see that? The, the lines are different. So what is, what is this? So for a woman to have a fan, need I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> and then, then she would do this, and she decide to say, Stop flirting with me. Go <laughs> and then, then when she's in a, sitting there in a leisure mood, she would do this. Is she really like this? <laughs> no, never. So what is real must be treated as if it were unreal. Are you with me? Yeah. It is just for art's sake. Okay, for an artistic uh, effect. And sometimes she points, she sees flower, beautiful flower in the garden. She, would, she was, before she was this, and all of a sudden she sees a flower. She goes like this. Then, then she opens her eyes wide, she would look, stare at the flower, and she would go near the flower and to gaze at it. And then she would open it, she said, Wow, this flower is so beautiful. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> and also, the moon. If she sees the moon, if the moon is over there, she would say, Wow, I can't believe the moon is so beautiful. It's so round and to, to take care of this side. So round. And 
I need to look at it again. <laughs> this time, she opens her fan, and she does this. Does she go away? <laughs> I think not. These little things are very important. So you must look at the, all the details. So this is a prop. All, prop. all the props are for dramatic effect, but not for real function. But something real, for instance, a flower, a pot of flowers. You cannot put a real pot of flowers because you need the performers to dance, to do this, to reach for the flowers and to pull it and to smell it and to tell you, wow, it's so nice. And then she'll pick it and she'll send the stalk back and she would hold this and to do this. Look at it and she would smell. But you do not see a flower. If there is a real flower, it would be an obstacle. It would, it would be the obstacle to her beautiful movements. Class, are you with me? Yeah. So yeah. nothing is for real on stage. <clears throat> Acting must be a thin line between subtlety, suggest suggestiveness, mm -hmm. and expressiveness. It's a thin line between that. Expressiveness, meaning She'll, like the modern women, a lady would openly express her favor for a man if she liked someone without the fan. She would say, she would look at the man and she said, mm, he is kind of handsome. You know, <laughs> you know I, 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 I fancy this, this guy. So, but she has to, but she has to play hard to get. You know, she said, oh no. Please don't. <laughs> go away. Please go away. But by doing that, but the way she does it, please go away. The men would know, please come to me. <laughs> I mean, girls get I don't need to teach you. You have played this game all your life. So, you know, people say, you know, like, what is your phone number? Why? <laughs> and they say, oh, this is my phone number. You keep it. Never. So I'm teaching you facts of life. <laughs> I'm not so old for nothing. You know? I learned a thing or two in life. So she'll do this. And then the men, instead of grabbing her and give her a kiss, in this theater, you will never find a man, young man, or old man, grabbing the hand of a performer who plays woman or lover or wife or anything. So as she's doing that, the man, as the sleeve is thrown away near him, he would pick up the sleeve and she would, she, he wouldn't let go. And he would do this. <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> Are you with me? So this is a thin line between suggestiveness and subtlety. So this acting and this is a convention. You cannot just throw sleeve as you wish. There's a way to throw it. And I will get to that sleeve thing. So much is left for the imagination of the audience, prompting Brecht, the greatest dram dramatist in the 20th century, German dramatist, Brecht, B-R-E-C-H-T, Brecht to comment that the Beijing Opera is the ideal theater in the world. <clears throat> in a theater ruled by such rigid conventions, only a performer, a performer who possesses special vocal and physical talents that eventually glow after years of hard practice tireless practice, can he create something artistically unique and perform more captivatingly than others? And then he or she becomes 
a star. Because you have to follow the convention. But the way you throw things, your sleeve, is better than anybody else, any other actress or actor who throws the sleeve. If you point the angle that you do it and the shape of your hand is more beautiful and the, the, the movement is more beautiful than done by any other actor, that would make you the star. Are you with me? So but everything is based on convention. But in Western art, it's seemingly not so. But actually, it's the same. You, do you think Picasso was born to paint people, people's face like one eye here, one eye here? <laughs> no. He could you, paint human being in his blue, uh, red period, periods. He painted, I mean, like Monet, you know, beautifully. And but later on, he he said, "I want, I need a breakthrough." So he had a breakthrough, and he was most heavily and importantly influenced by, by African art. So he started to create the, you know, his later work, the abstract and uh, surrealistic paintings. But all these artists, they had to learn how to paint a hand, how to paint a face, a bone. They have to know it, you know. So they have conventions too, but in the Western world, People, I don't know why, Art, even artists are so hung up on this individualism, you know, like you cannot copy me. If, when you call Anna Netrebko, you know, a soprano at Met, they call her the new colors uh, during an interview, and she got very uh, indignant. She says, I'm not Maria Callas, I am myself. That is the stupidest statement I ever read. So, <laughs> And so I went to her uh, opera twice, and, but now I will not go. I don't care. You know, my seat is in the seventh row in the center. I don't care. I, I don't want to go. I, I can't. You know? To make a statement like that is stupid. OK, you, you, may not, you may want to create your own, but Carlos had something to teach you because she was the best. There will never ever be another Maria Callas. Actually, she ruined a lot of operas for me. Just like later on, you will see. This, this guy, this man, he ruined Beijing opera performers for me. Because I cannot stand the sight of anybody else <laughs> after him. You know. So do not fall in love with a handsome man or the most beautiful girl. Because later on, your life will be miserable. <laughs> so you have to stick with them. Okay, that is an advice for you, Hagel. <laughs> uh, fourthly, as the genre is without a fourth wall of the traditional Western theater, it enables the performers to communicate directly and freely with the audience. In the Western theater, it's very famous, the fourth wall theory. Are you familiar with that? I'm on the stage. You're the audience in the Western theater. But now, our God theater is different. I'm talking about traditional Western theater. A wall, a wall, a wall, and the most important thing, the fourth wall between the performers and the audience. But in Chinese, in Beijing opera, in classical Chinese theater, there is no fourth wall. So before, I would say, she is my wonderful girl for the audience. I look at you, I say, she's wonderful. You see? And, but you shouldn't really go there. It's very dangerous. And I look at you, the audience. So a special report would occur be between the performers and the audiences, as in no other theater in the current world, as it occurs in the Beijing Opera Theater, a report between the performers and the audience. Be because the audience feels distinctly that you are acting for him. 
yeah, they, they are well blended into the drama. But in the, in the Western uh, world, that is considered a uh, taboo. You get out of your character to talk. But to the Chinese, I don't, we don't think so. Because everything is make-believe anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, a circular movement, yuan in Chinese. The character is sound, sounds uh, yuan, but not yuan hua. It's yuan. It means circular or round. This character must be demonstrated distinctly at all time on stage. For instance, when I point, do you see that I'm doing this? I said, don't go there. You see that? If a girl, woman, comes out, she points to the moon. She says, and the moon seems to be speaking to me. What am I doing? I'm drawing in a circle. Are you with me? Yeah. Then a circular line. Always. And what about warriors? They do. They come out. What's that? Circular. They do what is known in Chinese. Yin uh, Shou. Someone knows this. It's called the hand gesture that suggests the movement of clouds. Okay. Yin Shou. That's a yin shou. Do you see the, how my eyes follow the tip of my the index finger? And I do. Even my eyes, my whole head, my whole being is circular. Do you see that? Yeah. Why? Because the Chinese feel that a perfect circle represents a perfect union between the yin and yang the feminine and the masculine forces. It is only within a perfect circle that the two forces interact and they unite. Only through a perfect union can art and beauty be accomplished. And this character Yuan, circular, it can even stand for savoir-faire. You can say, but he's not slick. He's just, he doesn't hurt people. He, he has the savoir faire. <clears throat> These five outer features shape the Beijing Opera. But whence did they come, you might ask? What is the inner spirit that gives birth to these outer features? Because whenever you see a beautiful a child, a cute child. Invariably, I would do that. I would wonder about the parents. I said, I wonder how the mother looks, looks how the father, daddy looks. You know, I see it. So the same thing. Where, where did it come from? Out of the blue? No. Nothing comes out of the blue. Even when it rains, it is because heaven is sad. So he sends down his tears. Are you with me? <laughs> so everything has a reason to the Chinese. <clears throat> uh, so what is the inner spirit that gives birth to these outer features? The, I mean the most, the heart of the matter. For me, it is simply amazing that in Tennessee Williams' towering drama, the poetic streetcar named Desire. We hear his, his doppelganger, Blanche Dupois, appeal in desperation and intensity when she ex exclaims, I don't want realism. I want magic. Yes, magic. I don't tell the truth. I tell what ought to be truth. The end to all arts and all artists. This critique of the greatest poet playwright of America, Tennessee Williams. This 
line resonates as a clarion battle cry echoed from what had taken root in the minds and hearts of the Chinese artists centuries ago, who out of the conviction that cold realism must be transformed into magic of art and beauty, had fashioned a living theater that evolved into Beijing Opera. With its inner spirit being none other than what I call magical illusionism. Yes, magical illusionism is the inner spirit that gives life to Beijing Opera's outer features, which elevate every everyday speech into lyrical heights regular movements into fine and elegant dance, and raw emotions into drama. In art and beauty, you see, East and West brethren are. Now, today, you are in luck because I brought with me, and it will be shown to you, the performance by what New York Times called in 1930 when he visited America. His engagement for two weeks on Broadway was extended to nine months. When he visited Japan, Japan had a national holiday to celebrate his visit. Now, who is he? He is the lady that you see on the flyer. Have you seen that fly flyer? <coughs> Were you impressed with that picture? He had that picture taken at the age of 63, four years before he died. Ain't bad, huh? For a 63-year-old man. And wait until you hear the voice. And the voice for this special play because the title of the play is Bibulous Evening of the Imperial Consort. So she sings in a rather low voice. There are a lot, lot of, lot of dances involved. So she is a meta. It's not unlike Maria Callas singing Carmen. <laughs> so in this way. So now we will. So this is a scene. All the pictures are him. Or her. Okay. We're not talking about female impersonator. Okay. We're talking about a great artist. He sings, he acts, and he performs. And I know this is not an issue, but vulgarly, I want to remind you that he had 10 kids. Eight of them are boys. Okay. So you know what I'm driving at. Okay. So. <coughs> All taken at the age of 63. Oh, wow. So, that's it. That's it. This is the gesture when she, the lady in the, in the play, she sees the peony blooming. So she reaches out for the branch and she pulls it, she picks it, and she smells the flower. You see, mm -hmm. so this one pose is very famous. It's called Wen Hua. Uh, so Wen Hua is a special body uh, movement in this famous vehicle you created for Mei Lan Fang. This here is another pose. He is getting drunk. Uh, do you see the expression? Here he is looking, uh, the previous one, he is looking at the she, he or she is looking at the floating clouds. Do you see that? He's pointing. And uh, what is the uh, fan doing? He is moving the fan like this.
she she sees the cloud. She goes, suggesting the movement of the clouds. That's the scene. <coughs> Actually, I think she, he, looked even more beautiful in black and white. The last one is, uh, I would say, is my favorite. Not bad, eh? Yeah. You think, you have to think, this was done in 1957, 56, when makeup, art, art of makeup and lighting, not so as, as they are today. And, Someone could look like that. No Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't know how you feel about this for someone who has who has never seen Peking Opera before. You find this face beautiful. It's not only beautiful, and it's not a matter of whether or not a man could look like a woman. It's not. She, it, she transcends that. She is transcendental. She's magical. She turns herself into art. Art doesn't know gender. Beauty doesn't know gender. Both men and women can be beautiful. And I think it's a, and I would say, I would say the same thing as Harold Schoenberg said about, about Maria Callas' death when she died. I would say he was Beijing Opera because the title Harold Schomburg wrote was Maria Callas is dead at 53. She was opera. And I would say Mei Lan Fang was picking opera. Okay, now we're going to see a very short uh, uh, excerpt from the, this famous opera. The opening, opening scene is very short. Later on, there are a lot of movements. So if you like it, you can call me, contact me, come to my apartment, and we'll watch it, watch it together. Okay? And, but you have to bring some tea. <laughs> <laughs> Fine one, okay, not, not lip tea. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, yes, please. And you have the handouts, right? Yeah. And this is a polo musical. This is the this is the cast. Or the best is the Sterling cast accompanying her. Him. This is the synopsis of this. are the two units coming out before the star comes out. The background is placed there by the filmmaker. He insisted. So it's not a black, as I mentioned before. Yeah, for the film. These are the ladies in waiting. A baby of units and ladies in waiting until the star shows. Okay, she's about, he's about. Get my imperial carriage ready. is called Si Ping, and it's marked by gentle gentility, softness, because it's a spring night. She's happily attending a wine party, told by the emperor for her to organize it, just the two of them, two of them uh, 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 rendezvous. So the music is very gentle. <clears throat> Thank you. 
，不要坏，就是停在那儿，现在又要找又。Don't change, please. When I say pause, just pause. No, 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 no. Go back a little. Yeah. When I say pause, just stay there, please. You see the girl announcing her presence. Gestures. Everything means something. What is she doing? She comes out just to check if her dresses, robes are clean, so not not stained by dust. Are you with me? Yeah. With a dance movement, yeah. doing this, and then pass the fan and this, and then she comes out face the. So she gives an entrance, not unlike in ballet. You must come in with an entrance pose, a uh, eye uh, frozen pose. It's called in English. Yeah, you come out. Swan Lake, the Swan Queen comes in and she goes, and then she starts to dance. So in Beijing Opera, it's the same. <clears throat> So all the movements, have you noticed that she keeps, I mean the person in the, in the opera, she keeps looking at the sky and doing different things. What is she talking about? She says, ah, in the distance, the moon seems to be stirring, the light is moving. And so she's looking at it, she said, ah, this ice wheel, that, which I translate, is referring, it's a metaphor for the moon. So it's coming out and she keeps at it because the moon is rising, so she keeps moving to indicate that the moon is about to come out to shine. And she loves the moon because it's in the Chinese legend that there is this beauty who, Chang'e, who lives, who dwells, who takes the moon as her residence. So she is thinking about that goddess and she's thinking about herself because no woman doesn't know she is gorgeous. She knows, so she's singing to herself. She, so she's thinking about the moon, she's th thinking about this pleasant, she's hoping to be, a, what is hoped to be a beautiful evening that all the thoughts make her feel very happy. So she's in a happy mood, pointing to the sky, looking at the moon, thinking about herself. Okay, this is uh, when the moon comes out, the entire universe is full of lights. So this is the movement to talk about the entire world, universe. That's it. Pause. 
So here, finally, the moon is coming out. So she makes a, a hand gesture to say the moon is coming out, finally. So this is the moon. And this is the universe. They are all different. And all the light is shining, is this. You see, they are so subtly different. If you didn't know what it was, she was just moving, what the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's going on? Once you understand it, you say, wow, not only it's beautiful, but she does it, she is mixing. It's beautiful, soft, and tender, and gentle, and graceful, but it's not without strength. All beautiful things must have strength. So that's what makes her, every movement, there is a beginning, there's an end. She plays one point to one thing, and she stops at a point. Not like, nobody knows what she does. So if she says, So every gesture must end with an ending. And then she starts another dance. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. So if you see, you take that, that means she has some inner force, which is uh, having a pleasant wedding, you are uh, joining, uniting with a feminine force, seemingly feminine force expressed outside. So before she said, it sure looks like the moon, the Chang'e, the beauty, the moon goddess. And she makes a circle. She turns around, meaning the moon goddess is traveling, is walking, coming down to earth. The same way, just like, just like me, is referring to herself. Just like me, coming out of my inner palace to come to the imperial garden. All that, so every gesture is representing something. So unless you know this, then it's the entire opera would be, wa would be a waste to you. <laughs> <laughs> she goes to sit down, she does this. You see that? She's adjusting seemingly, just make, make a movement, dance movement, to adjust her headgear, her headpiece, which is glorious, which is called the crown of Phoenix, Feng Guan. And so she's adjusting that. Why? Because she's about to sit down to receive the eunuchs. So she wants to see to it know that she herself looks fine and grand. Are you with me? Yeah. So every movement represents something. Mm -hmm. Then she goes there to sit there. And then she starts the poetic recitativo to, to talk about who she is and what is she doing there. She says, rise. Look how she's, uh, he's doing with her, with his fan. <laughs> Do 
Do you see her doing this? She says, in a palace, there are 3,000 beautiful uh, imperial concubines, consorts. And but, three of them, but I is the most favored one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is meaning she's very self-complacent about her. She, and she thinks she is very secure in her position. Little did she expect to be stood up by the emperor. So the early, when she enters, she's in such a light and happy mood, which contrasts the disappointment and the, and the mortification towards the end of the play. And that's why she orders to have the drink, wine uh, brought to her and she gets drunk. So now this is a, a poetic recitativo to introduce herself. She says, the, I spent day and night to serve my king. And there are 3,000 beauties in the palace, but I am the number one. <laughs> so this is it. So please watch the whole thing again. This is what I have selected. <clears throat> so now I'm not going to interfere. So you just, <laughs> you just enjoy. <clears throat>
this is it. Do you like it? It transcends, you know? We're not talking about a guy playing a woman while he looks, he looks like a woman. It's not that. It's, it's about art. Magical illusion in its full splendor is expressly manifested, manifested to you, my friend, by the sublime and legendary Milan Baba. Blessed, blessed with a beautifully molded face and expressive eyes, a voice that suggests an exquisite Abinoni's oboe, and a body and hands that move with style. May I found an all-around artist of Beijing Opera. He radiates the ripening and blossoming of the theater, China's national musical drama. Not for nothing is he perennially acclaimed as the greatest Beijing opera performer in Chinese culture. For this talk, I jotted down on a whim, a doggerel as a requital to Thomas Nash's poem of Spring I cited before. Allow me to share it with you. Allow me to share it with you for your amusement. Whereas Nash rejoiced, spring, the sweet spring, is the year's pleasant king. Then blooms each thing and maids dance in the rain. My echo, oh sweet spring, none so sweet thou spring without opera of Peking, without the UN extolling so far its singing and dancing. <laughs> I needed that. I needed that. You know, I, I, I know some of the applause might be mercy applause, but still I love it. <laughs> I love it that you love it. How lovely it is to speak of Beijing Opera and Melan Fang on a day like this, early spring day, to celebrate Chinese culture and language at the United Nations. The talk and the season seem like a dual blessing from which some higher conception of life can be distilled. And so, this brief introduction, if this brief introduction can further enhance, however little, your appreciation of Chinese art and culture, I will not have come to speak in vain. Thank you so much. Just a few words of thanks. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to I, I tried. And, and <laughs> thank you so much for I tried so graciously accepting, accepting our invitation for the second time. <laughs> Last year, the presentation was so wonderful that we insisted on inviting Mr. Wang again <laughs> to add value and substance to the celebrations of this year's Thank, uh, you, so much. Day. thank you so much. You have it's the, it's the profound. Uh, knowledge, the insight, and a sense of humor, including self-replicating humor, that makes the presentation so enriching and uh, enjoyable. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, I, I got out of my cave. You know, <laughs> I, I got out of my retirement, and I came at the beckoning of you know, all my thank you, thank you so much. All, all my and the, and the moon palace, uh, you got your moon palace. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, it's, 
Exactly. I got out, out of my rat hole. <laughs> it's not home palace. All right. <laughs> you know, but you're too kind. After this lecture, I need I kindness think. now. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to love uh, Beijing Opera, starting from this lecture, right? Yeah. 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 Mr. Wang said, we're not human beings. <laughs> 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 We don't love a Beijing opera. And in the least, I think next time we go to a Beijing opera show, yeah. we'll be able to appreciate and yeah. understand the Beijing opera a lot more in its nuances and subtleties, you know, the symbolisms. And, so, and also, I think we will understand and appreciate our own lives a bit more. A lot yeah. more, I think. A lot more. And from the gentleman's side, I think we will understand the ladies, gestures, and words a lot more too. Hopefully that's not politically incorrect. <laughs> and, and, I, and I want to thank uh, Ye and uh, Rolando uh, for your great effort. Without them, this lecture truly wouldn't have happened. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Wan is, is somebody in high demand in universities, <laughs> in academic institutions, <coughs> in, in a lot of places. Okay. So without their persistence and the power of persuasion on the <laughs> hand, yeah, this truly wouldn't happen. So, and also, you know, Mr. Wang is a person of very rigorous standard for himself, for his work, for his students, right? And also for this particular lecture. So it means a lot more work for you guys, <laughs> but uh, it turned out to be a blessing because the result, as we have seen, is such a wonderful and enjoyable uh, lecture. Thank you so uh, much. To use the only words, Mr. Wang, uh, my gratitude and my our gratitude knows no bounds. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank you so not? much. When something ends, I always look forward to the next step, next move, to next year. Oh. <laughs> yeah. next year. So next hopefully year. you are again joining us next year. I'm still thinking. I'm <laughs> <laughs> day by day, you know, who knows? You can easily live to 120. Oh. That's my prediction. <laughs> At least uh, no, you look younger this year than, than last year. Oh. So we are very hopeful that uh, yeah. hopefully you will again accept our invitations. I had students who didn't do their homework. <laughs> I'm tired from yeah. being a te language teacher. Yeah. And, and also, uh, uh, thanks to all of you who are here today. And uh, Mr. Wan, please be aware that uh, uh, those who are present here is only part of the audience. And uh, a lot more people are benefiting from the web, uh, web access. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you again. <laughs> thank you. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.